So now it's farewell, or beginning again. When I started planning this service a couple months ago, I didn't imagine that it would be chock full of more or less everything you do here. We had a child dedication, REACH grants, um, we had uh, an announcement about a vigil, we had a changeover in Faith in Action Partners, and we have the, some of the amazing youth taking part in this service, the amazing youth who you have nurtured. And it has been a pleasure and a joy and a heartfelt benediction for me to get to know them a little and to have some of them here today. When I started, one of the stories I told you was about the interim minister who came to a new congregation. And the first Sunday, um, they sang three hymns. The second Sunday, they sang two hymns. And the third Sunday, they sang three hymns again. And the interim minister, this is a true story, not me, but one of my friends, heard people saying, someone saying as they walked out, first it's three hymns, then it's two hymns, now it's three hymns again. What will become of us? <laughs> so, yes, interim ministry, it's, it's about change. <laughs> and sometimes people say that interim, minister, interim ministry is about helping people to accept change. Uh, that's true to a point, but not quite right. Our ministry together has been about the possibilities inherent in the recurring transformations of our lives and the life of the world. And that's always going on. It's not just in interim ministry. And change of any kind, even the change we long for, is always hard to accept and cope with and that's true even if it's inevitable, maybe especially if it's inevitable. The skill that we have cultivated together is how to thrive in response to change. Rather than be powerless in the face of change, the skill is to interact with change productively, to claim it and explore it and learn from it and work with it. Sometimes that's a bit like riding a wild horse or soaring on air currents. And you know what? You'll get to do it again in less than a month. And the truth is, you're always doing it. This is actually what humans do. They find ways to claim change and work with it and make it their own and thrive. One of the things I promised you that I would do in that first Sunday that I preached was to tell you at the end of my two years here how being with you has changed me, what I have learned, how I have thrived, what I'm going to take away from this experience here and share with every future congregation I serve. One of the most amazing things that I saw here that I saw, have seen nowhere else is that your storyteller is almost always a child. And the way that this congregation supports and applauds and listens and embraces the story that is told by a child, maybe Maybe sometimes it's awkward, and maybe sometimes you can barely hear the words, and maybe sometimes they go so fast that you can't tell where the periods come. But it is such a statement of your caring for the children of this congregation, your welcoming of them into your midst. And I, I love it. And I, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, how can that possibly work? And then, I think it was Gavin, didn't you 
tell the story with me on the first Sunday I was here? Yeah. Starting with Gavin, I saw that it was amazing. So I'm taking that along. And then uh, another thing I learned was to take off my super minister cape. So this is a cape, you know, it's a little bit like Superman's cape, but it's a super minister cape that says, yes, I'm in charge of everything and I can decide everything and I know what to do no matter what happens. And it's interesting, I never before had the feeling that I was wearing a super minister cape, but after the first couple of months here, I began to feel this weighty sense of responsibility that I had to do it, whatever it was, I had to do it perfectly, I had to do it um, one time or before, and everyone had to like it. Whoa! So I was becoming Reverend Cranky Pants. <laughs> now, so I figured out, and I have to say, Liz Bredesen is the person, she literally gave me a red cape and said, take it off. So I've had this red cape in my office for a year now, and it's a reminder to me not to try to be super minister, that there are so many people I can consult and work with and love. And you know what? I think this is a, 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 a caution sign. Be careful not to subtly encourage your next minister to be perfect because that expectation I think is part of what I felt that made me feel this need to be perfect. Now, I won't deny that a little of that is just in my DNA. But I think it's important to realize that you really are all in this together and it's not all about the minister. Church really is what you are collectively. What you bring as individuals. Don't let any minister put on that cape because you'll always wind up with Reverend Cranky Pants. <laughs> Another thing that I was really skeptical of when I first came was this hymn of valor thing. I love the idea. <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of ending with a closing song that was often repeated each week. And I was told, you know, you usually alternate between um, the hours of religion and hymn of valor. Well, you know, at least the hours of religion was in the Teal hymnal. Hymn of valor had been written like 100 years ago, right? And I thought, oh, and it sounds so hymnish. And this was, this was really, you know, you know me well enough, you know, iPads and so on. I'm kind of 21st century. So I was really skeptical, and at first I didn't like the song very much. That was me bringing my expectations to it, right? And now I love this song. We're going to sing it at the end of this service. We've been singing it at the end of every service I've done for the last few months. I just can't get enough of it. <laughs> And this is, this is a change in me. This is how you have affected me. Your love for the song was a factor because it made me think, why do they love this song so much? And I began to pay attention to the words and how reassuring they are and what a good send-off they are. And so I thought, well, for my send-off here today, I definitely want to end with Hymn of Valor. And I don't know whether any other congregation can be persuaded to use this song, but I will bring it to them. <laughs> and we'll see. Another thing I've learned here, and it's been a two-year learning curve that will continue after I leave, and I think for many of you it's been a learning curve too, and that is we together have learned an awful lot about gender. So this started when a member of the, uh, well, maybe it was the, the welcoming team, or maybe it was the, uh, there's another team that, uh, somebody tell, help me out. What's the other team? The what? No, it was the team that especially is looking at welcoming, gender. 
Anyway, great team. <laughs> They're the ones who came up with the idea of putting pronouns on our name badges. Now, this is another idea I was a little reluctant to embrace because, yeah, okay, but why should all of us put our pronouns on our name badges? Can't people tell what gender we are? And the answer to that I have learned over the last two years is, no, they can't. I can't. I was surprised, very surprised, that someone I knew pretty well, a minister I've been a chaplain with at GA, a minister that I identified as she, her, hers, um, is actually they. She is gender non-binary, and she is. Did you hear that? Okay, I'm working on it. They are gender non-binary, and I didn't know it until they published a book, and I read the little bio, and I thought, oh, I made an assumption, and it wasn't right. And the one thing I have been taught as this process has gone on is the dangers of making assumptions about people's gender. And the other thing I have learned is that even though it might not seem like it would be that helpful, putting the pronouns on my name badge, small things like that, are a signal to people who are gender non-binary or transgender that I'm willing to be open to the possibility of what their gender truly is, that it's okay for them to talk to me about it, to share it with me, to let me know. And many of you have been learning along with me, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have this learning experience, because the world today needs people who are willing to be open to someone being a gender that to our, uh, I'll speak for myself, to my old brain, doesn't necessarily look like what my old brain thinks that person's gender is. And I, I'm so grateful to have that new information and I'm gonna keep practicing, trying as hard as I can to be open, not make assumptions, and to get my mouth not to misgender people. It's tough and it's a learning process that will probably go on even if I live to be 130 years old. But it's important because if we really mean to treat people with justice, equity, and compassion in our relationship was with them, the compassion part particularly means we have to welcome them as their authentic self. And we have to be open to knowing what that person's authentic self may be. Another thing that I thought I knew, but it's really been reinforced here, and I've definitely learned the centrality of this, is the healing power of good process. The healing power of good process, and that often means pause before flinching when someone says something. So. It's hard, you know, a flinch is pretty automatic, right? So if someone says something that shocks or surprises us, we often have a, a, a knee-jerk reaction. And the pause before we flinch, before we offer up that, out loud at least, that knee-jerk reaction, that's something that really helps for good process because it means we can actually listen to one another. And I have seen you embrace good process in many ways. And it's been really heartening to me, but I've also seen how knowing that a good process is going to be in place, knowing that I bring all my skills at listening, knowing that there's going to be this collaborative, thoughtful participation actually helps me to keep from wearing that super minister cape. So I thank you for that. And I think that if I have a message for the congregations I serve in the future, it's to, it's to welcome and embrace 
good process because not only does it heal divisions in the congregation, it also leads to much better decision making. It's important to remember that you actually are all in relationship with one another, in covenant. So we want to use processes that promote good relationships, positive relationships. We don't want to break those down with a lot of flinching. And finally, the authenticity, which is what I think I've been talking about, the authenticity that leads to meaningful relationships and the ability to begin again in love. So we've had some ups and downs, right? I mean, there's been some sort of a roller coaster feel to it from my point of view. And, and yet what I have seen is how you rise and embrace with authenticity your commitment to being in a relationship with one another and how even when people's feelings have been hurt, that you can begin again in love. This, if I could teach any skill to any congregation or individual I meet, it's that ability to bring that listening and yet authentic self to a conversation expecting that there will be listening and authenticity in return. And to promise in every relationship I'm in Whenever we disagree, we can begin again in love. Thank you for these life lessons. And I just have to say, and this is part caution and part apology, if you think that you found your true self during this interim ministry and that your life will unfold like a well-rehearsed pageant, <laughs> I have failed miserably, and I'm sorry. On the other hand, if you know that there are parts of you yet to be found, that some of them are quite beautiful, and that you can cope with whatever happens, then we've all done our job. That's as true for each of us as individuals as it is for First Unitarian as a community. When we thrive, knowing that there's still a ways to go, but we thrive together, that's success. And now I'm going to close with two haiku. These are my own. And I like haiku, and I think one of the reasons I like haiku is that for me it's a lot like interim ministry. Uh, first of all, you have to hope that you conclude with something that is coherent meaningful, sends a message, but you also only have 17 syllables. <coughs> it's hard to say goodbye, it's hard to bid you farewell, because I do love you. So, these two haiku, my closing message to you, I hope will inspire you in the challenges and change that lie ahead for us all. The hurts of the world press deeply upon us here. We hold them in love. Throw our heartbreak on the bright flame of the spirit. Love's power rises. Amen, farewell, blessed be.